Dr. Angela Kent is next on the list, professor here at the University of Illinois, studying microbiological communities that help sustain healthy ecosystems. Dr. Kent predicts impacts of global change and other human forces are the functions of micro, microbial ecosystems and enhances environmental quality by harnessing microbial processes. Uh, Iowa native, bachelor's from Grinnell College, and then two degrees from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Please welcome Dr. Angela Kent. Thanks so much. So um, uh, today I'm going to be talking about our work on uh, microbiome-associated phenotypes in maize to help uh, manage nutrient retention. So my name is on the title slide, but I'm here representing a terrific interdisciplinary team that's supported by funding for both um, basic and applied aspects of this research. And I'm pr um, particularly appreciative of the sustained uh, NREC funding that's allowed us to explore these microbiome-associated phenotypes in maize that contribute to uh, nitrogen retention and sustainability. So in my group, we're interested in managing soil microbes to improve agricultural sustainability and environmental quality. And I take a microbial community ecology approach to understand how we might manage soil microbes and their functions to promote sustainability. So what is it that we want to manage? Well, um, and what do I mean when I'm talking about sustainability? So uh, we're pretty focused on the nitrogen cycle. And ideally, we'd like to um, We'd like soil microbes to assist with nutrient provisioning, such as nitrogen fixation and nitrogen mineralization. And then beyond that, we'd also just like the um, nitrogen to be left in the field. So we're also interested in functions that contribute to um, or, uh, or that impact nutrient retention. So things like denitrification, nitrification, and dissimilatory nitrate reduction to ammonium, which I've spoken with you guys about in the past. Okay, so um, so as I mentioned um, on the previous slide, we we know a lot of um, a lot about the uh, microbial um, genes, the, the microbial taxa that are involved with uh, nitrogen transformations, and these genes um, are uh, displayed here on this uh, this diagram. They're fairly conserved, so we can use that to examine the. Um, the, uh, the microbial function group, functional groups that are in involved in each transformation. So we can look at the specific microbial populations that contribute to each of those nitrogen transformations I was showing on the last slide. And we can also, um, through a community ecology analyses, we can look at how they respond to agricultural management and crop genetics or other environmental factors. So, um, so we look at the overall microbial community, but we also focus on the specific functional um, groups involved in, in the various nitrogen transformations that are of interest to us. Okay, so we study the plant microbiome, and the plant microbiome is derived from the surrounding soil, and, um, and that's shaped by edaphic factors that vary across regions and across soil types. And I could give you an entire separate talk on the importance of edaphic factors for shaping the structure and function of the microbiome. Plants, plant metabolites, exudates, and defense systems serve as um, further ecological filters to shape the assembly, assemblies of microbes that um, colonize the rhizosphere or the plant interior tissues. So importantly for um, the focus of, of um, my talk here and my research uh, that's funded by NREC, plant genotype plays a role in the action of these ecological filters. So it su um, suggests to us that it might be uh, possible to intentionally modulate the, uh, the plant microbiome through plant breeding. Okay, so as we think about the effect that plant genotype could have on the microbiome and how we might manage that, we're thinking of three aspects. So, um, so to observe the microbiome as a product of plant genetics, there must be genetic variation in the set of traits that uh, are shaping the microbiome. There must be sufficient microbial diversity to be shaped by the microbiome, or by the plant phenotype, I'm sorry. So there's sufficient mi uh, microbial diversity that's, that could be shaped by the plant uh, host. And then the plant and the microbiome must have some sort of common dimension of interaction or limitation. So they have to um, be interacting for the same space or the same nutrients or something. So, um, so it's also the case that selective events, um, such as what happens during uh, crop breeding, can decrease genetic variation in plants and the microbiomes and could lead to um, loss of, of that variation that I was just talking about. And so that would lead to the absence of a plant genotype um, effect on shaping the microbiome. So then we would not be able to manage the microbiome through, through crop breeding. Okay, so, um, 
So how does uh, uh, crop selection affect the rhizosphere microbiome? Well, the, the microbiome can help plants acquire nutrients, and it also impacts plant health and plays a role in uh, competitive interactions among plants. But in modern agricultural systems, we've replaced many of the microbiome functions through nutrient inputs and other agronomic practices. However, if we want to promote sustainable uh, management, we need to increase our reliance on uh, microbial functions that contribute to crop productivity and success and replace those inputs with microbial functions like nitrogen fixation or mineralization. So, um, so the microbiome is currently a really attractive topic for efforts to improve agricultural sustainability. However, the efforts to um, improve the below ground interactions um, through agronomic management have, have overlooked a really critical component of this, the ability, um, and that is that the, the ability of modern crops to recruit and structure their microbiome could have been altered through um, domestication and breeding. Um, and as we think about this, uh, think about how we, how we carry out selection for, uh, for modern corn. So we, we carry out selection um, for high yields in environments with increasingly higher levels of, of nitrogen inputs, and that might have, extra, uh, had, have inadvertently led to changes in the um, root traits and the associated rises for microbiome, um, such that uh, it weakened any, any um, symbiosis collaboration between microbes and, and plant hosts for, um, for collaborating on nutrient, uh, nutrient acquisition and nutrient use efficiency. So, so th those interactions might have been compromised. So in turn, that might actually um, uh, limit the ability of modern crops to take full advantage of more sustainable and regenerative uh, approaches to management that rely on microbiome um, activities. So, so we started out asking, what has domestication and crop selection meant for the microbiome and its function? So uh, during the, uh, so this is some of our, um, our published work that was the, the foundation for uh, our, our um, some of our current NREC funding. Um, so during the Green Revolution, uh, maize selection and breeding, as I mentioned, took place under increasing nitrogen fertilizer um, levels, as shown here. And then um, when released from the need to partner with the soil microbes, what happens to the soil microbiome and its functions? So, um, so here I'm showing, um, uh, oops, sorry, selection has taken place under conditions where we've reduced reliance on um, microbiome functions related to, uh, to nutrient acquisition. So there's no selective pressure to maintain microbiome functions related to nutrient cycling. And what does that mean for the, for the microbiome? Now one of the great things about corn is that, and, um, and the resources that we have um, uh, through the USDA and through the University of Illinois. Is, um, so we have access to germplasm that spans the history of maize domestication and breeding. So that's an amazing resource. Uh, so we took advantage of that to compare the microbiome over a germplasm chrono sequence that spanned the Green Revolution. So I'm showing here a germplasm that, that was developed in um, different decades in um, uh, uh, during the Green Revolution. So this, um, so we planted all of these uh, different genotypes in a greenhouse study where we controlled the, um, the, uh, uh, the growing conditions. We planted them in maize-naive soil. And because I didn't want to study the microbiome of nutrient-starved plants, we um, did also fertilize these all at the same level. So for our first result, we saw that um, the maize rhizosphere microbiome is distinct among maize lines that were developed in uh, different decades. So I'm showing here this, um, this uh, ordination where each point represents the genotypic mean of um, the microbiomes associated with these, these different maze lines. So um, in, uh, in these ordinations, distance between points represents dissimilarity in microbi microbial community composition, and then we look for groupings that um, uh, are related to our a priori uh, analysis factors. So here, um, a decade of germplasm development um, is, is uh, a significant factor shaping the, the microbiome. So basically, um, the short way of saying that is like the microbiome changed over, uh, the microbiome recruitment changed as a function of, of uh, uh, maize germplasm improvement. Okay, so from that we used a network analysis approaches to identify specific microbial taxa that were increasing or decreasing in relative abundance in the rises for microbiome and um, uh, over the germplasm um, uh, uh, development chrono sequence that was represented in this experiment. So we, we identified um, uh, taxa that were increasing across the chrono sequence and then a, a number that were decreasing across the, the chrono sequence. From those, we predicted 
their functions. So, um, so, so based on those microbial taxa that were um, uh, changing over time, we can predict their changes in functions. So of, of interest for our sustainability and nutrient retention uh, topics here is the decrease in genes that contribute to, um, to uh, mining and uh, through mineralization or through um, nitrogen fixation too. So that agrees with our hypothesis that we would expect those, those more sustainable um, uh, nutrient provisioning functions to, um, or to uh, decline in the absence of, of um, any positive selection. Okay, similarly, we showed that genes and predicted functions that are related to nitrogen uh, provisioning um, were, were uh, uh, well, so we showed that, that um, nitrogen provisioning genes were decreased um, and then uh, the recruitment of um, uh, denitrifiers and nitrifiers increased in the more modern lines. So again, recall that these, um, these uh, germplasm, these, these maize uh, genotypes were all grown in uh, identical growth conditions with the same starting microbiome. And so it's um, um, particularly interesting to see the, the, um, you know, the, in, the, the change in uh, microbiome recruitment here, uh, given that they started with the same, uh, the same um, the same uh, nutrients. So again, it wasn't the case that these more recently developed lines were getting more nitrogen fertilizer, which might be, um, explain the uh, the why more of these functional groups were, were colonizing. Um, this is this effect was driven by the plant. These were all grown under um, uh, um, similar conditions. Okay. So from these early um, studies, we concluded um, that. Uh, the maize rhizosphere microbiome reflects the, um, the uh, uh, changes in the maize genetics during uh, um, germplasm improvement. Um, and this was independent of genetic relatedness, too. So uh, nitrogen cycling genes in the rhizosphere were, um, were altered across this, um, this timetable of germplasm development, um, and it was likely driven by increased fertilization rates and selection over time. Okay, so let's talk about um, uh, uh, selection for above ground traits. So those previous results were just some changes in the microbiome recruitment over the past several decades. When maize had already experienced a good deal of um, genomic changes through domestication and, 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 and breeding. And, and also um, my title sort of, you know, uh, um, promised something about, um, well, the title slide uh, uh, mentioned something about Teosinte. So, so what if we go further back in time? What, are, what sustainability traits got left on the editing room floor during domestication and the change from Teosinte here to, um, to modern maize? And what could we rediscover by examining the ancestor of modern maize? And this is relevant not just for food crops, but for bioenergy crops too, where we're just at the beginning of, of uh, purpose breeding, and we can make decisions to maintain or optimize um, desirable mic uh, microbiome-associated phenotypes that contribute to sustainability. And so, um, so I want to present uh, maize as a case study, or maybe a cautionary uh, tale, where we can look at the, long, uh, at the outcomes of long-term selection for above-ground traits on the microbiome functions related to sustainability. So here um, I'm showing some of the um, some of the uh, major changes that we that we see between Teosinte and maize. So we've got different um, different growth patterns, differences in the um, in the seed production, and difference in um, the root structure too. And so, what does that mean for the microbiome? So this is a um, similar plot to what I showed you before. Each one of these points represents a, uh, a microbiome sample. Uh, Points that are closer together have more similar microbial assemblages. Plots, or points that are further apart have very different micro, microbial uh, assemblages. And you can see that um, uh, the microbiomes associated, well, so, so we started with this, uh, this bulk soil microbiome here. From that, the, um, the microbes that were recruited by uh, different Teosinte genotypes were distinct from the microbiome. Uh, microbial assemblages that were recruited from the um, uh, domesticated lineages of maize, too. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's the main point there. Okay, so we followed up with a field experiment where we um, looked at nitrogen cycling functions. So we said, okay, so maize and teosinte, they're, they're um, recruiting different microbiomes. What does that mean for the function of, of the microbial communities uh, associated with, um, with these plants? And so, so here we demonstrated in the field that nitrification was significantly reduced in teosinte lineages. So we had six different uh, lines of teosinte 
grown um, in the same conditions as our domesticated maize, a potential nitrification assay in the lab that demonstrated a significant reduction in, um, in nitrification rate in teosinte. Now, um, this phenotype of suppressing nitrification and some of the uh, mechanisms that are involved with that are known in related grasses. And this was um, whoops, recently described in sweet corn too, but it hadn't been described at this point in, um, in field corn that's grown for grain. So, so grain maize has not displayed this uh, nitrification inhibition phenotype at all, um, which is uh, you know, much the dismay of farmers, environmental scientists, and the Gulf of Mexico. But, um, um, but, but maize, so, so as, as you know from um, talks earlier today, the maize ecosystems lose uh, substantial amounts of nitrogen that's applied as fertilizer, in part due to nitrification and subsequent leaching of the nitrate that's produced through nitrification. So inhibiting this pathway um, could help to, to retain nitrogen in the field and contribute to maize yields while reducing nutrient pollution. So I also want to point out the, um, this uh, um, acronym that I'm go going to be using um, going forward from these slides. Okay, so, um, so we took a finer scale look at the timeline of, of maize, um, or, uh, we looked at, at maize over a timeline of uh, domestication and breeding to kind of say when, when did maize lose this, uh, this microbiome associated phenotype. And we showed that the ability to suppress nitrification has been eroding across this timeline. Um, and so these modern uh, maize lineages here are the worst at inhibiting nitrification. So sorghum is um, known to suppress nitrification too, and we uh, and we see we also do see um, variation among these um, among sorghum lin lineages too that we're pursuing in our bioenergy related work. Okay, and then for reference, this is a uh, chemical nitrification inhibitor, so this would be like as as inhibited as nitrification is going to get in soil. Okay, so so far our results suggest that domestication has changed the structure and the function of the microbiome. And if we could identify genetic changes for um, the genetic basis for these changes, then um, it, it could be possible to incorporate these um, microbial partnerships into future plant breeding efforts. So to narrow down the portion of the teosinte genome that might be responsible for suppression of these um, undesirable nitrogen uh, transformations, we took advantage of an existing panel of amazed teosinte near isogenic lines where, um, where we have small portions of the teosinte genome in a modern inbred B73 background. And so we, we use this set of near isogenic lines um, that covers most of the teosinte genome. We grew them um, in a, our similar um, field experiment. And the first thing to note is that we reproduced our previous results showing a suppression of nitrification by teosinte here. So comparing the two in the middle, the um, B73 and teosinte, we're still seeing suppression of uh, uh, nitrification. Now, most of our neuroisogenic lines also exhibit exhibited the modern maize phenotype, which makes sense because they are largely B73, but we were successful in identifying two neuroisogenic lines that exhibited the teosinte phenotype of suppressing nitrification, and that narrows down our search for the mechanism for this phenotype. So what did we find in those um, uh, intragress genetic loci? So based on those phenotypes, we were particularly interested in genes that were, uh, might be implicated in the synthesis of known compounds that are involved in su uh, suppression of nitrification. So in these intragress loci, we found genes that um, uh, from the Sorgo-Leon pathway in one of our um, neuroisogenic lines, and that's um, Sorgo-Leon is one of the previously identified compounds that's capable of, of inhibiting um, nitrification. Um, Okay, so, so among the teosinte uh, loci, we also found genes that have been previously implicated in microbiome interactions and stress responses too. So all of these might have something to do with uh, um, uh, changing how maize interacts with its microbiome. Okay, and then um, these teosinte intergressions are pretty large and they contain hundreds of potentially important candidate genes. Um, so we're using additional neuroisogenic lines to narrow down the intergressions to identify candidate um, uh, mechanistic genes, and then we're carrying out back crossing um, and um, and uh, CASP, uh, and genotyping through to help narrow down the uh, BNI locus. And this is part of our um, our work that's funded by uh, by NIFA. So, so with this information in hand, then we, um, we uh, can then test the metabolism of these lines to see if we can measure changes in root phenotypes that could be indicative of alterations and further cons confirm that um, we're seeing suppression of nitrification. So that work is ongoing. 
Okay, so of interest to this crowd is, um, our, is our strategy of stacking microbiome-associated phenotypes. Um, so we've got this intriguing trait for nitrogen retention, this uh, biological nitrification inhibition, and, pot and potentially that could reduce greenhouse gas production in maize too. So what are some of the actionable outcomes uh, for this? Um, so there's been a lot of buzz lately about inoculants, and I heard some um, uh, diazotroph inoculants mentioned in earlier talks today. So nit nitrogen provisioning by diazotrophs is definitely a goal, and there are biotech companies that uh, have their sights on that. But one thing that we need to make sure of is that um, that fixed nitrogen, we'd like to um, have that stay in the soil and not um, lost to nitrification. So we'd like, so the idea of stacking traits is to um, use a diazotroph to fix nitrogen and nitrification inhibiting corn to um, uh, uh, inhibit the transformation of that fixed nitrogen to, um, to nitrate and, and lost. So, so sub substantial rates of nitrogen fixation could very well enhance nitrification, and, and that's something we'd want to know about because it, would in, it could enhance um, uh, nitrate leaching if it's not paired with an appropriate nitrogen retention strategy. So, so we're, uh, we set out to investigate, with uh, NREC funding, we set out to investigate if um, combining the uh, uh, BNI phenotype with nitrogen fixation could have a synergistic effect. So like I said, we're looking to fix the nitrogen and keep it in the rhizosphere, and I have some results to share from that. So, um, so we evaluated the potential for, um, uh, for BNI to reduce nitrogen losses, um, and, as well as to evaluate the synergy between nitrogen-fixing inoculants that are generating ammonium and, um, uh, and then uh, BNI corn that's inhibiting nitrification, too. So not surprisingly, nitrification rates shown here respond significantly to the fertilizer. So I've got um, fertilizer in the different panes here. So, um, but nitrification also responds um, significantly to the presence of the diazotroph inoculant, particularly in the fertilized treatment. So we can see more nitrification happening here where um, we've applied a diazotroph inoculant. So that's kind of bad news for the diazotroph inoculants. However, we did see that nitrification trends lower in um, the rhizosphere of the um, uh, nitrification inhibiting um, uh, neuroisogenic line, and it's, um, so, so that's, um, that's good news and, and uh, some variation that we can work with. Okay, and so this, um, uh, we saw some similar trends in 2022 as well, um, uh, although the uh, inhibition of nitrification was not as significant here. But um, there does appear to be a greater a trend toward greater potential nitrification in the um, fertilized inoculant treatments at, um, at VH, suggest, suggesting that the activity of the inoculant could be contributing to nitrification through providing substrate. Uh, but this was quite variable and uh, was not apparent at um, a later uh, growth stage. So we, um, looking at the microbiome specifically, we can pull out the nitrifier taxa, and we can see that the relative abundance of nitrifier taxa um, is correlated with, um, with uh, what we're seeing in the nitrification rate, too. So nitrifier relative abundance, um, shown here, is reduced in the um, BNI genotype, um, at, which uh, suggests that the rhizosphere microbiome is, um, is being shaped by the plant genome, particularly by those teosinte-specific loci that contribute to nitrification inhibition. Um, and so what does that mean for corn performance? So in, um, in 2021, our biomass uh, and concentrations were enhanced by the, by the BNI phenotype um, or, uh, compared to, um, compared to uh, regular B73 corn. And, so, and this was uh, particularly in combination with the uh, nitrogen-fixing inoculant. So I'm showing here results for um, the VT growth stage. And key comparisons to look at are um, the BNI uh, versus B73 at um, zero nitrogen. So nitrogen um, levels are on the uh, x-axis here. So if we look at um, B73 versus BNI at zero, we're accumulating more nitrogen in the BNI corn. Um, and you can see that the um, that difference is even greater when we um, start adding the inoculant too. So um, uh, the, um, uh, the BNI trade is also valuable at, um, at, at the fertilizer level and then um, with the added inoculant too. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so the take home message from this is that the BNI uh, phenotype is associated with greater biomass um, nitrogen. And we repeated those results in our 2022 growing season as well, showing greater nitrogen accumulation in our BNI genotypes along with um, a greater response to the um, uh, 
diazotrope inoculant, at least for one of the, um, the uh, NILs. Okay, looking more broadly across um, grasses, um, so I'm showing maize and sorghum results here, we can see that, that um, in, uh, in general, that lower nitrification, so suppression of nitrification, uh, is associated with um, greater biomass accumulations too. So, um, so that suggests that this is, you know, this is a phenotype worth pursuing, and there are a number of groups that are, that are interested in this. Um, we also found that uh, increased uh, grain protein content in fertilized treatments, too. And I think Logan has um, uh, some of these results on his uh, poster as well. So Logan and Mitra have posters over here that you can uh, uh, follow up on this later. Okay, so, so we interpret these plant performance metrics, so plant biomass and, and nitrogen and grain protein and, and kernel weight, too, as benefiting from the additional nitrogen that's available to the plant due to the inhibition of nitrification. Okay, so um, one of our objectives in our most recent um, uh, round of NREC funding was to determine if the integration of Tiosinte genes that confer nitrification inhibition impacts maize yields. So input from um, the uh, NREC review board um, identified this as a really critical objective for uh, introducing this phenotype into modern maize hybrids, and one that needed to be addressed if we wanted to implement um, nitrification inhibition as a strategy to reduce nitrogen losses. So over the past couple of years, we've been busy generating um, uh, experimental hybrids. We crossed B73 and the nearest, and the, um, the um, nitrification, the BNI nils, with uh, uh, several different um, non-stiff stock inbred lines. And so we, uh, um, so we ended up with a bunch of different hybrids. And here we um, demonstrated first that the hybrids um, retained the BNI phenotype. So the um, the hybrids are. Um, shown in yellow here, or, I'm sorry, the BNI hybrids are shown in yellow here, these are all hybrids. The, um, and we, um, we've retained the nitrification inhibiting phenotype in our hybrids, some better than others, but, um, but there it is. Okay. Next, we found that the integration of Tiosinte genes conferring the nitrification inhibition did not strongly impact yield overall. There was some variation in grain yield responses um, uh, based on both the BNI near isogenic line and the and you know which non-stiff stock line we used as the um, as the uh, as the other parent, but um, but in general, our take-home message is that the um, presence of the BNI trait does not inhibit um, yield in or does not interfere with yield in these experimental hybrids. Okay, so the other phenotype that we're interested in um, stacking um, is denitrification. So I mentioned earlier that inhibition of denitrification was an another desirable phenotype that could reduce nitrogen losses and contribute to um, nitrogen retention. As it happens, our field experiments also discovered that denitrification is suppressed in wild Tiosinte genotypes, and so that um, de inhibiting denitrification would be a desirable phenotype to uh, integrate into um, modern maize as well. So we searched our near isogenic, our maize Tiosinte near isogenic um, panel to uh, find this phenotype, and we identified three different near isogenic lines with the uh, uh, denitrification suppression phenotype. And um, we're following up with similar approaches from our uh, BNI work. Okay, so we've also um, observed that nitrogen fixation might be carbon limited. So particularly um, the, uh, this inoculant that we're, this proven inoculant that constitutively fixes nitrogen. So um, as a uh, microbial ecologist, I can tell you that nitrogen fixation is an extremely expensive process, requires a lot of carbon, and, um, and so it is not surprising that a constitutive nitrogen fixer might experience some um, carbon limitation. So I'm interested in seeing if we can re relieve this carbon limitation through plant traits um, uh, it, you know, so in our bioenergy uh, work, we're, we're, ex uh, we're exploring plant traits that um, uh, produce additional root exudates, but we're also interested in um, our recent work in, carried out by Dr. Below's lab uh, looking at biostimulants, so carbon additions at the time of planting, and I think that that might help to support nitrogen fixation through these early stages um, and allow it to persist until the plant can kick in and start helping with uh, supply carbon as well. Yeah. So. Um, so our next steps are to, uh, with our current round of, of um, NREC funding, are to see if, um, uh, if nitrification is inhibiting, inhibited, does that also reduce denitrification? I'll look at uh, nitrogen, um, uh, nitrous oxide losses um, or reduce, uh, reduced amount of greenhouse gases due to these, um, uh, these plant phenotypes. 
And then can we, uh, can we help the plants increase their benefit from nitrogen fixing inoculants through um, understanding the limitation of the inoculants and through, and through um, uh, adding microbiome associated phenotypes that keep the, uh, the nitrogen near the corn? So in, in, in total, is this all enhanced by the combination of inoculants and biostimulants? Okay, so just to follow, just to finish up here, sum up. So our, our um, uh, typical plant breeding has not uh, incorporated microbiome associated phenotypes and, and may have resulted in less sustainable plant genotypes from the perspective of these um, microbial functions. And so what we're aiming for is um, development of crops that incorporate this, this idea of genetic shaping of the, of the plant microbiome, um, so basically breeding for um, uh, these microbiome-associated phenotypes, treat them as a selectable trait to maximize sustainable ecosystem services while minimizing disservices. Okay, so uh, yeah, so our, for our future directions, um, we are looking to uh, narrow down the plant genetic markers that are responsible for those traits, identify the specific chemical mechanisms that are responsible for those traits, and basically engineer sim um, symbioses for nitrogen acquisition. So I kind of like a, a microbiome matchmaking or matchmaking between the, the, the plants and the microbes. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions.